Amen. That is just glorious. I'm telling you, so awesome. I, I yesterday was it yesterday or day before yesterday, just that you uh, we were talking about our music today, and we were talking about you know the, the fact that you know when you've had COVID. You, you kind of have all kind of little uh, hang-ons and stuff, you know, like sometimes your voice is a little scratchy. Sometimes you have to still have a little bit of a cough. And anyway, and your head's kind of stopped up a little bit, you know, even though there's really nothing there. Uh, well, let me <laughs> say that. <laughs> that was a slip. That was a Freudian slip back. <clears throat> no, there's plenty of stuff in your head. It's just not any of that old COVID stuff. But anyway, but, it, but anyway, you ha- so you have lingering kind of issues. And so one of the things that... Uh, we were concerned about is, you know, how would our music be? Because all of our guys had it, and, um, you know, you, you guys are in the safest place in the world right now. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I think everybody in this building's had it. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, the, so we didn't know, and Just said, just said yeah, let's just go, let's do our, our, our regular stuff, you know? I mean, let's do all of it, and uh, do four songs, five songs, whatever. And he said, uh, and we said, we looked at him like, man, you know, come on. And he said, I'll sing them. That's what he said. He said, I'll sing them. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, I couldn't sing. Yeah, and then he said, I'll sing them. <laughs> you know, and then, uh, and, uh, but I'm telling you, he and John both were in fine voice this morning. I just, and it enthused me and made me happy. I, I, I enjoy praise and worship, and I really do. And live is just unique how God lifts your spirit. I don't know about you. But he's already lifted my spirit. I'm serious. I, I mean, I came in here dragging one foot and pushing the other, you know. And uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, it's just like, hey, let me give you a little. Let me give you a little spizzerinctum right here. You know, you need a little shot of spizzerinctum. And uh, for those of you who don't know spizzerinctum, you're not old enough to know that valuable asset. But anyway, that uh, old snake oil spizzerinctum. But anyway, it cure anything, uh, you know. But anyway, the point being that I'm I'm fired up about it, and I I really need to be because I get, I have about oh whew, uh, some message to share here with you. <laughs> I don't know how much I'm gonna I'm gonna do it all, but um, because I've already done half of it, so I've just I mean there's no doubt about that unless the Lord comes while I'm speaking or something happens to me in some way. But I started with you a couple of weeks ago talking to you about four signposts prophetic signpost of the last days. And <clears throat> I shared with you that um, of all the books in, in the world, all the religious books, all the holy books, all the books of every religion, any religion in the world, there is only one book that contains a word of prophecy. Prophecy is writing history before it happens. And all the authors of those human books knew that if they put one word of prophecy in their books that did not come true, that their books would be disregarded and thrown away. So none of them put any prophecy in their books. But God, with daring and boldness, put words in, 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 in his book that talked about individuals and races of people and nations of people and, and, and societies and movements of world that would happen 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 years into the future. And so God has given us a book, a Bible, 66 books, written up by over 40 authors over 1,500 years of time, where none of them knew what the other would write, none of them knew that the other had written. There was no internet, no printing press, there was no way to know what anybody else wrote. And they wrote it as the Spirit of God led them to write these things and share these things with us. And 25 to 30% of your Bible is, is, are words of prophecy. And most of those words are about the period of time that we are living in right now. Most of the prophecy in the Bible is about the last days, the end times. So what does that tell us? That tells us that God wants us to know what is going to happen in these last days. That God wants to assure us that he has us. I got you. I got this. And no matter how bad it looks and no matter how horrible it seems, and it 
And, and, and I'm serious, I've, I've quit watching the news because it is just terrible. Every day there's a new low hit by our current administration. Uh, I don't know what's gonna end up happening with all of that. I, I don't know how long it can keep going like all of that. But I do know one thing, that no matter what happens, God says to us, his children, uh, I got you. Don't be afraid. Comfort one another with these words is what the scripture says. So God says, I've written you stuff that will comfort you, that'll help you be at peace in your life. So receive it and hear it. Now there's one book in the Bible that um, is in the Old Testament, and I haven't mentioned this to you, but I know that many of you that study the Bible, you've studied the book of Daniel, right? The book of Daniel is an Old Testament book. He's a prophet of God, a major prophet in the Old Testament. The book of Daniel is, <clears throat> half of the book is just completely dedicated to the end times prophetically. It has 12 chapters. The last six are phenomenal about last time things. Even timelines that are down to the intricate point when Christ was crucified. I mean, it's just unbelievable. There was one section though of the book in which the Spirit of God said to Daniel, do not tell them what I just told you. Do not write this in your book. Seal it up, he said, until the last days, and then it can be revealed. And the reason why is because God was showing him what would happen at the end of things and the people of his generation didn't need to know that because they weren't that generation. Now, I truly, I'm saying that to say to you that I truly believe that God, the Spirit of God, is opening up all of the last days prophecy now because these are the last days. I think any sensitive Christian, I think any nominal Christian that has the Holy Spirit living in their life whether they truly know a lot about the word or they don't know very little about the word or, or, or they've just uh, gotten saved last week or they've been saved for 30 years. I think all of us have a sense inside of us that these are some phenomenal times that we're in and these are certainly days that uh, the Bible seems to describe in some very vivid ways. Well, I, I, I believe this. I believe these are the last days. Uh, and I started sharing with you four reasons why I believe this. And I called them signposts. A signpost does two things for you. It tells you what road you're on, and it tells you about how far you, ha you still have to go to get to your destination. So in these four prophetic signposts, they do point about what road we're on and give us some indication not an exact, you know, not an exact indication because no man knows the day or the hour or the moment except the Father. He's the only, Jesus told us that. Don't even, don't even try to get that specific. But it, but it does tell us about how far. It does give us the, the season and the, and, 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 and the effort that we're in. Number one signpost was that Israel becomes a nation again for the second time and it happens in one day. This has never happened. This is a miracle of miracles, by the way, and this is the first signpost because it's the most important signpost. Because if Israel had not become a nation again, there would be no end times. Because the end times is all about Israel. Everything in the end times is about Israel. If there was no nation of Israel, there would be nothing to be fulfilled in the end times because it's all about Israel. And here's one thing that you'll notice. If you study Bible prophecy, when Israel is in their land, the clock is ticking. The time is moving. The signs are being fulfilled. When Israel's not in the land, the clock stops and everything sits in suspension. And then when Israel gets back in the land, clock starts again. So what I'm saying to you is that because Israel has been back in the land since May 14th, 1948, by the way, that happened in a day. It's never happened before. As a matter of fact, Israel's been out of the land two different times. God's brought Israel back into the land two different times. Only nation on the earth that has ever lost their land, lost their language, lost their culture, lost all of identity of itself, 
and then ever came back as a nation again. And, and God's done it with Israel twice. Once when Nebuchadnezzar came in and the Babylonians and took them captivity for 70 years. And then when God loosed it, he took Cyrus the Persian and sent them back into the land of Israel. And Cyrus rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the wall, rebuilt the city. It, you know, amazingly, all of that prophetically spoken, by the way, before it ever happened. And then Titus, the Roman general in 70 AD, came in, killed over a million Jews, destroyed Israel, destroyed the city. Not one stone of the temple was left on another except that that was underground, which right now is the Wailing Wall. That's the only reason it's there. It was a foundation stone under the ground. Every other stone was thrown off. He, sowed the, he, he, he plowed the land, sowed it with salt so it wouldn't grow any crops took the rest of the Israelites that he didn't kill captive, scattered them over the, over the four winds of the earth, over all of the earth, and from 70 AD until 1948, what is that, uh, 1,878 years? 1,878 years, there was no nation of Israel. Israel did not exist. May 14, 1948, through a miraculous set of instances, God brought Israel back. That's signpost number one. Before Israel came back as a nation, I don't know why anyone would have said Jesus could come because that's the first signpost. It, it, it would be ridiculous to think that. So he's back, they're back in the land. Here we are. Signpost number two, Jerusalem's reunited under Jewish control for the first time in 1,897 years. I almost rounded that up to 1,900 years because it's just easier to say. But to be precise, 18, uh, 1,997 years because in 70 AD, Israel was taken out of the land. They came back in 1948. When they came back in 1948, they did not have the entire city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the capital of Israel. Jerusalem's the heart of Israel. Jerusalem is what all these wars are going to be about, about who's going to occupy Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? I mean, a little city of Jerusalem, but it's so powerful because everybody seems to want the apple of God's eye. And it's going to be the cause of the war between Gog and Magog, and it's going to be the cause of the Battle of Armageddon. It's all about Jerusalem. Well, Israel only had half of Jerusalem in 1948. And then by a superset of miraculous, unbelievable deliverances of God, I'm talking about overwhelming odds, way like 450 tanks to one, you know, kind of overwhelming odds. The Six Days War in 1967, in June of 1967, Israel whipped <laughs> all of them on every corner and took the whole city of Jerusalem and has had it ever since. And Gaza and the West Bank and all those lands, we have since made, made them give some of it back, but we're never gonna be able to, we're never gonna, they're never gonna give Jerusalem back, any part of it. So that's, you know, you can, you can hear it discussed now. You can hear pressures from the UN, pressures from the United States, pressures from every country in the world. Give me back, give me back, give me back. Pacify the Palestinians, pacify the Palestinians. And look, I don't, I'm not trying to be negative about Palestinians. I don't even know any Palestinians. And they're probably wonderful people, but their leaders are terrorists. And they're evil and wicked. And, and, and they have been standing in the way of peace in the Middle East for the last, well, ever since they've been alive. So that's never gonna happen. So because now Jerusalem, and by the way, in 2017, the United States recognized Israel, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And then on May 14th, 2018, President Trump moved the embassy, thank the Lord, moved the United States embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem uh, signifying that we agreed that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. And they'll never lose it. Signpost number three, the issue of Jerusalem causes the world to unite against Israel. The whole world is against Israel. And I don't think anybody has to convince you of that. If you, if you do need to be convinced, just watch one United Nations assembly meeting. You'll find that the United Nations is the hate Israel club. Everything about Israel they hate. They want it destroyed. Most of them don't even acknowledge the fact that Israel is a nation or that it has the right to exist. 
And they, and they bring all kind of sanctions against Israel and all kind of uh, uh, charges against Israel. We have China, we have North Korea, we have Iran, we have uh, many dictators in the world, we have countries that kill their own people, gas their own people, abuse their own people, put their people in prison. I mean, we, we have some major human rights abusers in this world, terrible human rights abusers that sit on councils and committees in the UN judging Israel for being a human right violator. Oh, come on now. I mean, this is just the wicked world we live in. Well, it is, is, it is uh, the, uh, Jerusalem is going to be what causes the world to unite against Israel. They all want Jerusalem to be given to the Palestinians. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strong arm. It's a, it's a you're going to do what I say you're going to do. It's a, you got to obey. I mean, it, it, it's just a, a move to force Israel to give up its capital and its heart that God has given it. Israel has, Jerusalem has been given to Israel by God. Benjamin Netanyahu is the prime minister of Israel. Here's one of the constant statements he makes. And, and he's not the first prime minister to make this statement. But here's the statement he makes. Jerusalem is the eternal and indivisible capital of Israel. Jerusalem is the eternal and indivisible capital of Israel. Which I think we would agree and say, praise the Lord. That's exactly right. But it is that statement that's going to start Gog and Magog war and is going to start the Battle of Armageddon. What happens to Jerusalem? Signpost number four, the land of Israel has been divided. Now, this, ha this has happened in a couple of small periods of time. Israel, I told you in 1967, they took all their land back. The Gaza Strip, the West Bank, all of the fertile land, all of the... <laughs> billion dollar boardwalks and harbors and all of those things. Israel had all of them. In 2005, the Bush administration strong-armed Israel to give back the Gaza Strip, which is the most fertile and productive land in the entire nation. It cost Israel billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars because they gave it back. And there have been other tiny parcels, and right now, the land for peace deal is just being pushed at every chamber. Give them back the West Bank. Give them, split the city in half and have a, a two-state solution. Two-state solution just simply means Israel gives back everything God gave them and, and lets the Palestinians have them so the Palestinians can keep lobbing make, you know, bombs over the fence and, and killing innocent people. That's what that means. Well, that's predicted. That's prophesied. That's, that's God. So there, th those are the four signposts and those are the four indicators that we are indeed in the last days. So what does this mean? What are the implications of this? So what? We're on the right road and we're very, pretty close. What does that mean? Three things. Number one, we are likely the final generation of this age. Yep. And people go, what? What? We're likely the final generation of this age? Pastor, are you saying that Jesus is coming back today? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's today, but he could because all the groundwork is there. All of the word is there. Things have been fulfilled. But because all four of these signposts have been, I mean, look, these things are not happening. They have already happened. They are fulfilled. They are biblical predictions by God over all of his word, and they have happened. They're not waiting to happen. They have happened. And I believe that we are not only in the end, we're in the end of the end. That's what these signposts would mean if, if you believe this, if you believe that that's what God said and that's what's happened, then you would have to conclude that we are at the, at the end of time. Now, why would I believe that this is the final generation? 
Now, I want you to understand, and I'm gonna put a disclaimer out there. And all of you people watching, this is a disclaimer. I am not predicting that Jesus is gonna come back this year or any other year that I know of. I do not know anything about the timing. I'm just saying that we obviously are in the season that the Bible says the end is going to happen. Nobody knows the day or the hour. You would be foolish to even try to predict a day or an hour. But certainly God gave us all the information we need to be able to comfort each other with the fact that the day that we are in is the season of the end. And he talks about it over and over. He talks about the last days. He talks about the final days. He talks about the end times. Clearly identifying the fact that there is an end time. There are final days. There is an end of time. And so are we there? Well, let, let, let's, let's look at some word. Let's look at Joel chapter three. I want you to see, why would I believe that we are the final generation? There'll be no more generations after us. We'll see the return of Christ. Joel chapter three, verses one and two. For behold, Joel says, Joel is a prophet, by the way. You, you guys know that, I'm sure. For behold, in those days and at that time, which Joel says there, there's, there's coming a time, so we're talking about a time, the time of an event, a season, all right? In a certain season, uh, in that day and at that time, a specific time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the valley of Megiddo. That's where Armageddon is fought, by the way. Jehoshaphat was the king of Israel. They named the valley after him. It's the valley of Megiddo where Armageddon will be fought. I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. Notice who's talking. God is speaking in first person. God is saying, I did this. I will do this. I will bring them in. I will scatter them. I will war. I will stand against so this is not a prophet trying to interpret what God is saying. This is God himself saying, this is what I'm gonna do in that day and in that season. He said, in that day and in that season, I am going to bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem from among the nations. Now, you know this is not talking about anything that was done in history because the only time Israel was out of the land in history was when Babylon took them out of the land and all of them went to Babylon. They didn't go to the four nations. They didn't go to the nations of the world. They weren't scattered over the face of the earth. They were in one nation, Babylon. If he was talking about that time, he would have said, I'm gonna bring my people back from the captivity in Babylon. But he says, I'm gonna bring my people from all of the nations. When am I gonna bring them back? May 14th, 1948. So he said, all right, on that day, the clock is gonna start ticking. May 14th, 1948, begins the clock. Everything that happens, happens from that period, from that time forward. And he says, here's the thing I want you to see about this. God says that Whoever sees Israel brought back from the nations will also see God bring the world into the valley to the battle of Armageddon and judge the world. If you see them gathered back, you are also going to see God bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and do all, do all of the, the judgment things that he talked about. Let me, show you, let me show you Jesus saying it, all right? Here's Jesus in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn 
the parable from the fig tree. Israel's always been the fig tree, by the way, in the scripture. One of their emblems is the fig tree. At one time, that was their national state. I don't know if it is now. Their crest of their nation was the fig tree. It probably is not now, but it, it has been in the past. Now, learn this parable of the fig tree. God's talking about Israel. By the way, the reason I know he's talking about Israel is because Matthew 24 is all about Israel. If you look at Matthew 24, this fig tree passage is down in verse 32. There are 31 verses before this, and all of them are talking about end time stuff. It's talking about the tribulation. It's talking about the Antichrist. It's talking about the abomination of desolation. It's talking about the battle. It's talking about all the nations coming against Israel. It's talking about Israel having to run for their life. It's talking about the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, and everything that happens to him. And then it says, now learn the parable of the fig tree. What would God be saying? God would be saying, all right, look, here is a fig tree sitting here and it has no leaves, it has no figs, it has nothing. It is, not, it is dormant. It is lying there dormant. Just like this world is lying here dormant. This, uh, they're waiting on something. What season are they waiting on? They're waiting on the season when leaves start coming out and figs start coming out and things start happening to that tree. But right now, that's not what's happening. But at some point in life, the fig tree is going to begin to bud when its branch has already become tender and it puts forth leaves. What are you going to know when that happens? You're going to know that summer is near. So Jesus said, look, when you see stuff happening in Israel and you see leaves starting to bud and, and, and things start happening, you know that you are entering a new season, a summer season. The fall is over and a new season has started, but, but let me go on. So you also, verse 33, so you also... When you see all these things, all what things? Well, the things he's been talking about for 31 verses. When you see these things, there will be sign in the suns and the moon and the stars. There will be earthquakes in the lands. There will be, I mean, all of that. That's what, he's what he talks about in those 31 verses. And then he says, now here's the word for you. When you see these things, Know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What's Jesus saying? Same thing Joel said. The people that see the beginning of the end are gonna see the end of the end. The people that see it start are gonna see it end. That's the generation. That generation will not pass away until they see all of those things fulfilled. So if you've seen the beginning of the end, which this generation in May 14, 1948, that's the beginning of the end. The end of the end is at the end of tribulation when the battle of Armageddon is fought and God destroys Satan, evil, and all of that. And he says the same generation is going to see the end, beginning of the end and the end of the end. Let's, let's just go on, okay? Because, I mean, you're probably saying, oh, the pastor's gone off his rocker. All right. Let's just see. Now, the whole question then becomes how long is a generation, right? If he says this generation is not going to pass away, how long is a generation? Well, let me give you just a little bit of warning, all right? Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, that we need to be careful when we're listening to people talk about uh, scriptural things, especially prophecy, because people can make up stuff and people can think they know some stuff and they don't know it. Now, many people, you listening, you listen now, go, go to YouTube, go, go on any, any uh, place where you can watch uh, sermons and messages and so forth. I guarantee you, you'll find thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of messages about what time we're in right now, all kind of predictions, all kind of everything, people making up stuff. Here, people say, oh, I had a dream last night, and in that dream, God told me that a generation was 40 years. No, don't listen to that mess. That's not, that, that, that's what, let, let me just read what Peter, is it back there? Okay, look, look at what Peter says. 
And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Here's the warning. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? Don't listen to somebody who says, God spoke to me and told me that a generation was 45 years or 30 years or I had a dream or I had a vision in the night and the Holy Ghost spoke. No, 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 no. That, that's private interpretation. you making something up. God, didn't, God does not speak that way about these prophetic times. He has it in his word. His word tells us how to interpret these times. Not some uh, spirit of something somewhere. And I'm not mocking the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying that God said that's not going to happen through Peter. He's not going to do it that way. You don't, have to, you don't have to wonder about it. So what does the Bible say about a generation? How long does the Bible say a generation is? Well, that's where the problem comes in. I think God, personally, um, is meaningfully vague about this. I think it is vague because it's a whole bunch of different numbers, okay? I mean, the Bible, I'm going to show them to you. We're going to read them in the Scripture. You'll see what they are. But I, I'm saying to you that I, I think God is vague about this intentionally because if he wasn't intentionally vague, we could come way too close to some, to, to some stuff we don't, we don't need to know. So he just kind of, let me just show you what I mean. Here's Job chapter 42. In Job 42, it says, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. Well, if you take 140 and divide it by four, that's 35 years for a generation. All right, let's move on. Matthew chapter one. This is, the, this is Jesus' lineage and so forth. Now look at what Matthew said. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. Did I put the numbers? I sure did. All right, I want, because I, it would be confusing if, if you didn't see them. All of the generations from Adam, I mean, from Abraham to David are 14 generations. All right, Abraham began in 1996 B.C. 1996 before Christ is when Abraham came around. All right, David died around 970 B.C. That's a total of 1,026 years. And there's 14 generations, so we divide 1,026 by 14, and we get 73 years for a generation. From David until the captivity in Babylon, all right, David, David's birth was 1040 B.C. He died in, in uh, 970, so you see he's about seven years old. And they came back from Babylon about 537. So that's 503 years. Divide that by 14, and now you got a generation that's 36 years long. And then the last example are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until Christ, the captivity in Babylon started at 607 B.C., and Christ was born about 3 or 4 B.C. He wasn't born at zero, guys. Jesus was born about three, because the transition, you know, you're changing from A.D. time to B.C., I mean, from B.C. time to A.D., from before Christ till after Christ, and, and it didn't start at zero, you know, because they didn't really know he was Christ until on later when he resurrected, and then, you know, they go back, and the crossover between the solar calendar and the lunar calendar and all of those kind of things are just, there. anyway, the point is, he was born about three B.C. All right. 3 BC, uh, 607 to 4 or 3 BC is 603 years. Divide that by 14, and the generation's 43 years long. So we've got uh, generations being 35 years long. We've got them being 73 years long, 43 years long, 36 years long. 
Well, let me throw one other little calculator in the mix, okay? This is Psalm 90, verse 10. Listen to this one. The days of our lives are three score and 10, which is 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are four score, which is 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and trouble. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. What's David saying to us? He said, the length of a life is 70 years. By the way, this is true. Medically, medically, this is true. Back in 1948, the average lifespan of an American citizen or a person in the world, well, probably American citizen, because I don't think the world would live this long, was 67.25 years. The average age lifespan of an American, men and women, of course, you know women live longer than men. They were at 69 point something and men were at 64 point something. The average was 67.25 back in 1948. In, 19, in, in, in 2020, you know what the average lifespan is? 80 years. 80 years old in 2020. All right, so medically, not only prophetically and scripturally, but medically, medically speaking, uh, experientially, medically speaking, this is, this, is a, this is a reasonable thought about a generation. So David says, okay, a normal life, 70 years, but if you get blessed by God, you could live to be 80 years old, but if you live to be 80 years old, you're still gonna have trouble and sorrow in your life, and your life's gonna be soon cut off, and you're gonna fly away. Makes me think of the rapture, but he didn't say it was. But, but that's what, I, what you're thinking about. So, just to emphasize now, just to emphasize, and please remember the disclaimer, all right? Remember the disclaimer. Just to emphasize how close we are, if a generation began in 1948, how many years has it been? Well, in May of 2020, it had been 72 years. So we're already past the 70. The, the length of a man is set three score and 10. So we're past 70. So now we're moving at 80 being the length. I'm just, this is an example. Don't get all panicky about it. This should be encouraging to you. It is to me. This is encouraging to me to think that Jesus could be really close Look at what's happening, guys. Can you live long? I mean, how long can you live in that? How long can the country survive in that? How long can the world survive in that? I mean, it's been one week of the new administration and the whole world's turned upside down. Millions, I mean, well, at least hundreds of thousands of people have already lost their job. If you ask them, they think the tribulation period started last week is what they think. They don't have any way to feed their family. They don't have any way to make their money. They're going to get kicked out of the house. They ain't got nothing. They ain't got nowhere to work. Go fix solar panels. Look, I worked at a solar panel place. You are not going to, you're not going to turn that around and just start doing that. And by the way, it has the nastiest waste. You know what I did at the solar panel place? I filtered heavy metal waste that could not go into the water system because it would kill everybody in the city. And that's just the waste from solar panels, the stuff that gets sprayed on it so it can duck electricity and, and, and create, you know, spray it on the glass so it can conduct electricity. It's ridiculous, idiocy. But there it is, one week, just one week. How many, what's next week gonna bring? And the next week and the next week. I'm just saying to you that it should be exciting to think that Jesus, this is the season that Jesus comes in. All right. So we're past the 70 year point and the generation that sees these things will, will not pass away until they be fulfilled. Uh, Joel said, you see the beginning of the end, you're gonna see the end of the end. So here's what that means. The generation that sees Israel become a nation will also see the end of the tribulation. So the length of a generation talked about here would need to include the seven years of tribulation. So let's look at it for a second. You know, as Christians, we are going to stand before the Lord. I believe with all my heart, and I'm going to try to prove it to you next week, that we are going to be raptured 
That means taken away, snatched away before the tribulation starts. I, and I, I think I can prove it to you scripturally. And, it, and So next week will be that. I believe that before the tribulation starts on this earth, we will be taken away. We are going to spend seven years in heaven, most likely at the marriage supper of the Lamb, while on earth, seven years of hell is going on called the tribulation period. At the end of the tribulation period is when God brings all the nations of the world against tiny Israel and then rescues them himself by coming out of heaven with all of us with him, setting his foot on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split right down the middle. The valley is formed with the Valley of Jehoshaphat and the Valley of Megiddo. And we're going to be hovering probably about right here watching the, the greatest but shortest battle in the history of the world because Jesus is going to defeat them with a word from his mouth and we're going to be sitting right there ringside looking at it. And they're going to be destroyed and the blood's going to run as deep as the horse's bridles, all that kind of stuff you've heard before. That's the battle of Armageddon and that is at the end of tribulation and that is what Joel said is going to happen and the generation that saw the beginning is going to see that. Jesus said the generation that saw the beginning when they're gathered together, you're going to see that. So you got to figure the seven years into your timetable. So we have 72 years from 48 to now. Add seven more years of tribulation in it. What you got? 79. Four for generations, 80 years. You're pretty close, aren't you? What are you predicting, Pastor? Jesus is coming this year? Well, no, I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying that the season is pretty tight, pretty tight. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't dare guess. Uh, let me tell you, any of you remember back in 1988, a, bo a, a book that came out, uh, 88 Reasons Why Jesus should, Will Come in 1988? Did, did any of y'all read that book? It was written by Edgar Wisenant. It was a big deal back then, man. Well, some of you guys weren't old enough probably to be an interest in that. But it was. It, it, was a, it was a national book. Man, it just sold zillions of copies. Wizenant tried to prove that Jesus was coming, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. You know why he missed it? Because he figured that a generation was 40 years. And if a generation was 40 years, he would have been right on it. Then he wrote a book after that called 90 Reasons Why Jesus Should Come in 1990. It was wrong also. I'm a human being. I could be totally wrong. I could be telling y'all something, you know, but I don't believe that. I believe God has backed it up in his word. And I'm just saying that we're in the season. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, although we don't know the day or the hour, the season, the, 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 the time, in that day, specific day, and at that time, specific time, not, not just any day and any time, but that day and that time, there's a day. There's a day planned. And you're, all right, here's the second implication. That's the first implication. Can y'all hang? All right, here we go. Second implication. We are experiencing the birth pains that will usher in the return of Jesus. The Bible talks about, prophetically speaking, that the way we know that Jesus is about to return, that it is imminent, is through a natural um, analogy with the birth of a child and, the, and his return. He said, all right, think about my return being like the birth of a child. And here he is in Matthew 24 that I've already read the end about the fig tree. Let's go back to verse three. Let's go back to the beginning and see what he says. Now he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? I love the way the disciples do, don't you? You know, when Jesus asks them, when he, when he tells a parable or something like that, and, and then he, he looks at him, he says, do you guys understand what I'm saying to you? 
And they go, oh yeah, 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 we got it, we got it, we got it, Lord, we got it. And then when they get back somewhere privately, they always say, man, what in the world were you talking about with that thing? We don't have a clue what you meant. Well, Jesus is walking by the temple. It's grand and grandiose and all that kind of stuff. Now it's gonna be torn down in about 40 years, but right now it's majestic. And the disciples are saying something about, hey, look at that temple, isn't it beautiful? And, oh, yeah. and Jesus says, well, I tell you something, the day's coming when there won't be one stone left on another of that thing. And he just kept on walking. So now, privately, the disciples are saying, all right, when's that gonna happen? <laughs> you know, you said that, when is that gonna be? He said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be. All right, so they want to know when the temple's going to be torn down and what will be the sign of your coming? That's another question. And what will be the sign of the end of the age? That's another question. They're not all the same question. There are three different questions there. One about the temple, one about his rapture, one about the, the, the battle of Armageddon and tribulation, the end of the age. He says, all right, let me tell you. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, that's war, and kingdom against kingdom, that's civil war. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Look at this last line. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The word sorrows there is the Greek word odin, and odin means birth pains. These are the beginning of birth pains. All of these things start happening. That is the beginning of the clock ticking birth pains. Now, I was born in 1956. A, a month from now, two months, well, March 28th, nice gifts are appreciated. <laughs> Money will do it all. Now, in 1956, all right, so I'll be 65 years old in March. I know you're shocked, but maybe you can get over it. But uh, my bus was, by the way, uh, they were shocked, my teenagers. They said, what? I think they were just trying to make me feel good. But anyway, I've never seen, I, I was born in 1956. I'm, I'm 65 years old. I've never seen things happening like they're happening now. I've never even come close to seeing it. And, and I will remind you that I was a teenager in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Those bunch of wacko idiots, those bunch of mental cases, I think what happened is they didn't go away. They just laid low and became politicians. You know, I, I think those crazy hippies are, are, the, are our senators and representatives and presidents and stuff now. They're just as crazy as they were back then. They stood out in a park circling around a tree, you know, wow, man, let's stay out here, make love, not war. All right, who's going to feed you? What you going to do for a living? How, you can't live in a park in a tent and you don't have any food, you don't have any job, you don't have any way to maintain yourself. I mean, idiocy. All right, so remember, I did see that, but... We could blame it on drugs, you know. So, I mean, at least it has a reasonable uh, 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 concept about why they were so crazy. It was drugs, you know, LSD and all that kind of stuff, cocaine, all that, heroin. We don't have an excuse now. It's just pure evil, delusion, is our only thought about it right now. And so, what am I saying? I'm saying, obviously, I'm a man. And by the way, there are only two sexes, male and female. You one or the other. I just thought I'd throw that in in case somebody might be confused. I'm a man and I don't know anything about birth pains. I've never had any birth pains. But I am a pastor and have been for 45 years and I've been in a lot of places where women were birthing children. And I have found that as the child approaches the birth pains get more severe and they get closer together. As a matter of fact, you can start having birth pains and not even notice it. Tanya did with Justin. 
I went to work that day. She, she had been up since, what, three o'clock in the morning, something four o'clock in the morning, hurting right back here, right there. She thought, you know, just sleeping wrong. And, you know, Justin weighed nine pounds, so he's big, he laid up in there and ate chocolate pie the whole time. <laughs> so she thought, well, he's just pressing on something he shouldn't be. And so she got up and all that. Well, I was, wor I worked. I worked in a warehouse and I was going to finish in school. And I worked all day in a warehouse and went to school at night. I went on to work and uh, we needed money, you know. We were poor as could be, but, but I went to work and about 10 o'clock or 10.30, Tanya called me and said, hey, you need to come home. I think I need to go the, to the doctor. I think something's going on. And so, I, I, of course, I was nasty from head to toe, covered with dirt, and I was gonna go in to the chamber with her, you know, the birth, childbirth stuff and uh, beer coach and all that. And so I had to come home. I stopped on the way home to vote. It was election day. Uh, I voted in a tiny little precinct. I just walked in and voted right on home. I mean, I was on my way home. I, she didn't sound too alarmed. I mean, that's what I'm saying. And then I got home and I had to take a shower because I was gonna go. I mean, they wouldn't let me in the hospital looking like this pig. So I took a shower and then by the time we got to the doctor's office, I had to carry her about halfway across the parking lot, a, a contraction hit her and I had to pick her up and I had to carry her. And she was pretty heavy at that particular point. <laughs> <laughs> she was tiny when we got married, but with Justin, um, she weighed about 50 pounds more. She just, you know, she enjoyed being pregnant, let's put it that way. And, and, uh, and I took her in and the doctor said, we gotta get you right over the hospital. You're five centimeters dilated. All right, so what I'm saying there is she started having birth pains and she didn't even know it. So some birth pains can start and you not even be aware that they've started. But the fact is, as the child gets closer and closer, you're gonna to begin to notice because those contractions are gonna get more severe, they're gonna get harder and harder, and they're gonna get closer and closer together. And the closer you get to the child being born, the harder they are and the closer together they are. I'm just trying to put a little analogy out there about how it's been in our lifetime and how evil and wicked and fast-paced everything is now. These birth pains are getting harder and harder and closer and closer and closer together. The only good thing about birth is, and this is just from a man's point of view, so ladies don't get mad at me. There are two sides, I, I, I think there are two sides of a maternity ward. The pain side of the maternity ward is where women are struggling to have these children and they're, and they're having more and more pain and more and more struggle as they go, and you can hear the distress in them while these babies are right before they're being birthed, and then you have the joy side of the maternity ward, which is when they bring the baby back in there and the mothers see them for the first time, and their joy is full because of what God has done and birthed through them. When we see Jesus' face, guys, it's going to be worth it all. When we see his face, he's going to eliminate our memory of pain. You know, I, 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 being a pastor, I've done it a bunch of times. I, I love to do this. When someone's having a child and we go to visit right before the child's born, I say, all right, let me have, can I have a word of prayer with you? Uh, yes, Pastor, and I have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to leave now because this is not my daughter or my wife, so I, I'm, I'm going to leave but right before I leave, I say, well, how many more children are you gonna have? And they always say, no, 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 They're like, ah, no, 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 I'll never have another one. You did, he did this to me, you know, kind of thing. And then whenever I come back after the child's born and the child's in the room and they say, come look, pastor, come look, pastor. And they're holding him and they just go in and And then you say, how many, you, you, have you changed your mind about about these children, are you gonna have any more? And most of them, they're not quite, we I mean, may not have gotten completely over it, but they're a lot milder that second time. Well, <laughs> well, I'm think we might have two more, you know, so like. anyway, it just, it, it just, when we see Jesus, it, it's gonna really make a, a difference. So 
I believe that we are in severe birth pains right now that are going to produce Jesus pretty quick. We're going to be seeing the face of Jesus here pretty quick, I think. Let me read you Luke 21. Here's Luke 21. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and the stars. Now, I'm not an astronomer. I don't even, I can't even find the Big Dipper. Uh, everybody says, there it is, don't you see it? I go, what? It looks like a star. I, what is that? I can't see any of those things. So I'm not an astronomer, but, but just my casual observation and just a little tiny bit of astronomical knowledge, which is very small, it just, it, there have been so many events lately that involve the sun, the moon, and the stars. And, 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 and seasons and, and, and things that haven't happened in 200 years or 300 years or 400 years and have four of them in a row and five, you know. I mean, they're just tremendous things going on like that. So Jesus said, there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and stars. And on earth, distress of nations. Are, are we having any distress of nations going on right now? Oh, my Lord. COVID is all over the world. We got a worldwide pandemic going on, don't we? I mean, and in that worldwide pandemic, people are dying, people are losing their jobs. It's an economic disaster, and anarchy is rising up out of it. We have people in this country that are trying to destroy this country over all of this mess. Clearly trying to destroy the country. Turn it into socialism or communism or whatever it is. Man, are we having distress among nations? Whew. Dismantling the law enforcement, using terrorism to threaten honest, hardworking Americans. As a matter of fact, I'm about halfway wondering if I say anything up here, if they're not going to come arrest me. If I said anything negative about uh, any specific person, why, why would I, I mean, I'm an American. I ought to be able to say whatever I want to say. But I have to kind of think a little bit and don't think those phones aren't listening to you. I know that sounds like a conspiracy theory, but just remember that. Anyway, on the earth's distress of nations with perplexity, that means there's no answer. There's no solution. Give me a solution to any of this. How are you going to solve it? What would fix it? How can we fix it? Yeah, that's the only solution right there. You, there we, don't, we don't even have an answer on how we could do that. It's so bizarro and crazy. And Jesus, at, let's see, where am I? Here I am. Uh, waves, yeah, 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 excuse me. The sea and the, and the waves roaring. Uh, when you see the sea and the waves in prophetic speaking, it's talking about groups of people. It's talking about nations of people, large numbers of people. So what this is saying is that, that large numbers of people all over the world are upset. They are, they are they're, they're rioting. They're, uh, they're out of bounds. They're out of control. Now, remember, these are signs that he's talking about. He said, when you see these things begin to happen, know that the time is short. Uh, verse 26, men's heart failing them for fear. I'll probably have a message on that in about five or six weeks about this fear right here. This is the word, this Greek phobos, from which you know we get the word phobia. It sounds just like it. Phobia means terror. Jesus is telling us that there's gonna be terrorism in these last days. And notice what, the way it describes. Men's hearts are going to be failing them. They're going to be, they're going to be a, afraid because of, of terrorism and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the power of the heavens will be shaken. Look, you know, you know what the, well, the worst part of terrorism is? It's not actually what's happening at the moment. It's our fear of what's going to happen next. Jesus said, that's one of the signs of the times, man. Then they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. That's a, the rapture, by the way. These intense birth pains lead to Jesus for us Christians. For the world, it leads to tribulation. Now, when the, look now, when these things begin to happen, look up 
and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That's good news. Is that comforting to you? When you see all these terrible things happening and it's just getting out of hand and there's no answer to it and it's horrible, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. Now, just one little point about that last verse. That verse means it happens quickly, right? I mean, when he says, when you see these things begin to happen, he didn't say wait and lift up. He didn't say take your time. He, he said, when you see them happening, look up right now. I mean, look right now because your redemption's right. Your, your redemption's right at that door right now. So it's not going to be something that lasts a long time. He says, when you see these things start happening, it's going to be pretty quick. And looking, and that's good news for us. And so, uh, pains are tough now, but when we see his face, it's going to be wonderful. All right, let me give you the third implication. All right, the first one is, we're the last generation. Second one is, the birth pains are telling us that we're about to see the face of Jesus. Third implication is, it's time to live for God and stand up for our faith in Jesus. If there was ever a time to live for, live, to live for Christ, to live for God, and to stand up for our faith, it's, it's now. Let me show you. This, this, this verse this, that I'm about to read is talking about Christians in the tribulation being killed by the Antichrist. And let me just say this to you, that there will be some Christians in the tribulation. They won't be Christians before the tribulation, but they will be one to Christ during the tribulation. There'll be 144,000 uh, Apostle Pauls, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel will be preaching the gospel during the tribulation. They're gonna win some people to faith in Christ. There are gonna people, be people that come to the Lord. Now, it won't be any of us, but it will be people that are alive during the tribulation period. And uh, you've got two prophets, uh, many say Enoch and Elijah, that'll be doing signs and wonders and just amazing people about the power of God. Now, I mean, there'll be people that will give themselves to Christ, won't take the mark of the beast, and, and they'll be martyred and all of those kind of things. So I just want you to know there will be some Christians, but there'll be people that got saved during tribulation, not somebody that got saved and left behind. All right, this is the book of Daniel, chapter 11. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, the covenant is Israel. So Daniel's saying, those people that do bad things against Israel, he, meaning the Antichrist, shall corrupt with flattery. In other words, if you hate God, he's gonna love you. <laughs> you know, he's gonna, you're gonna be his best buddy. He's gonna flatter you and all that. But the people who know their God shall be strong, look at this, and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame by captivity and plundering. There are going to be people coming to Christ and those people that are coming to Christ, the Antichrist is going to kill them with a sword. He's going to burn them at the stake. He's going to persecute them all over the world. But those who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Now, here's what I'm saying. If people that are saved during the tribulation and they know they're going to be killed... They're going to be burned at the stake. Their head's going to be cut off. They're going to be mutilated and martyred. They're going to have a terrible end. But if those people, in spite of knowing that, can do great things for God, then we, we certainly can do great things for God. I mean, what's wrong with us? We're not being martyred yet. We're not falling by the sword yet. But I'm just saying to you that that it, it's not time to, 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 to bow our knee to political correctness. It, it's not time to shrink back like, like wallflowers so that we'll keep from hurting somebody's feelings. This is a time where, 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 where everything's on the line and, and, and just remember, Jesus died on a cross naked. 
I know we don't put him up there naked. We put a little, little something over him. He was naked on the cross. He, in front of his mother, at the, at the crossroads of the world. And he wasn't ashamed of us. We shouldn't be ashamed of him. We ought to stand for him. We can do great exploits. We can stand for him. We can be who we are in Christ because, listen, the eternity of people are riding on this. And it, it, I know most everybody in here has probably made five or six professions of faith in your lifetime. I mean, we're all sensitive to the Lord. I'm not mocking you. I'm just saying, if any bunch is saved, you probably are all know Christ. I mean, you've, you're serious about it. But if there's ever a time to know Christ, I'm just saying now's it. Because time is near. I mean, I really believe that. Now, am I saying he's coming this year? I, I don't know. I don't know. But he's coming some year. And, it, and, it, and it's going to be soon. I do believe that. And how soon is soon, I don't know. But I, I am, uh, next week I'm going to talk to you about the, the rapture. And I'm going to tell you a few things that I think are um, revolutionary in thought. Um, and it'll, it'll uh, I think it'll, it'll help you and it'll um, give you something to really pray about and think about. So anyway, be praying for that if you come back. I don't took all the time today, but anyway, hopefully. All right, is everybody, are you scared? Or is anybody in here scared? All right, are you encouraged? Does this encourage you? I mean, does this comfort you in some way to say, God says, I got it? Hey, this is not surprising me. I'm telling you everything that's going to happen. I'm telling you what it's going to be like. I'm drawing a picture for you, and I've got your back, and i got a plan, and it's going to happen just like I'm telling you it's going to happen. So don't be afraid of this stuff. That's why he wrote this stuff to us, so that we could comfort one another with these words. And I know some of you are thinking, well, I want to I wanna have time to live my life. I'm just in eighth grade. I can't, you know. Look, let me tell you something. Heaven is going, I'm going to be preaching on heaven. Next week's about the rapture, and then I'm going to start preaching. I got five messages already. I think that'll be probably all of them, but about what is heaven like according to the Bible. Not, not somebody's near-death experience that wrote a book or something like that. I'm talking about what does the Bible say heaven is going to be like? What are our bodies going to be like? Uh, are we going to enjoy pleasure in heaven? Is heaven going to be an intimate place? Are we going to be together? Will we recognize each other? Uh, what will we do? What about our authority? What kind of, what's it going to look like? How's it going to be? The Bible tells us every bit of that. The Bible tells us every bit. Not, not, not even making up stuff that you think. Just read a book. Here it is. He tells us all this stuff. It's great, Timmy, I'm telling you. You have never experienced anything on this earth that is even close to what you're going to experience in heaven in any way. You are not going to be floating on a cloud, playing on a harp for all eternity. <laughs> you, you learn that from Tom and Jerry, the cartoon, right? Or Roadrunner, somebody like that. that no, that's not from the Bible. That's some, something we come up with. Uh, we're thinking about uh, from a movie somewhere. No, no, no. No, man. You're not going to be bored in heaven. It's the most exciting, wonderful, adventurous, great place that it, ever, ever. And you'll be so excited to go there. I guarantee you. All right. So anyway, let's, let's bow. Let's bow.